So good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session. We have our first working session. We'll start with our first working session, Building Bridges Across Oceans, the first part. Yesterday we talked, Dr. Gopalakshan talked about bridges across oceans. This is on literature and languages from India, Latin America, and the Caribbean in conversation. We're delighted to have Professor Vibha Maurya as, as chairing the session. Um, Professor Moria retired as a uh, professor of Hispanic studies in the Department of Germanic and Romance Studies at the University of Delhi. She's published extensively in Indian and international journals and has ed edited several books and translated into Hindi, Spanish, and Latin American novels and poetry. Her major contribution is the first ever direct translation into Hindi of the masterpiece of Cervantes, Don Quixote. She was awarded the Pablo Neruda Presidential Medal of Honor of the Government of Chile in 2004. And in June 2010, she was elected to the Spanish Royal Academy as corresponding member in India. Uh, Professor Moria, I request you to introduce the session and the speakers. OK, so welcome back to this uh, session, uh, which is session part one of literature and language from India and Latin America and the Caribbean in conversation, building bridges across oceans. And uh, we have a distinguished panel here today um, who, who all are from the field of literature. So it's a little shift away from what we did in the morning. And um, carrying forward the discussion which uh, Mr. Marmol started in the morning on magical realism, I just want to add one thing that uh, my own understanding as Hispanist in India is that we had two very important moment of this uh, connection between Latin America and India, and that one was the uh, the visit of Pablo Neruda in India and his entire work, which was translated. I think there is hardly any language in India which has not translated uh, Pablo Neruda's poems into their languages. And the second moment, of course, is the magical realism. I don't think there's any literature in India which is untouched from this, uh, this um, category of writing which we got from, uh, from Latin America visibly and practically, but many contest that it was already existing in India. So that's why it was very appealing for our writers. So these were very important moments for us. I'm not going to take much of the time, and I'll go straight to the session, we have uh, first uh, speaker is uh, our poet, editor, uh, um, Alex Pausides from uh, Cuba, Havana. He's president of the Poetry Festival and founder of uh, Sur Editors Collection of Havana. He is director of the cultural, he was director of the cultural magazine El Caiman, Caiman Barbudo, which we all uh, no, and is president of the Cuban Writers Association. He was president of Cuban Writers Association till 2019. His poems have been translated in many, many languages, including Farsi, which really attracted my attention. He has published a dozens of books uh, in America, Europe, and Asia. He was distinguished with the Critics Prize in 2006, Vladimir Mayovsky Award from Union of Russian Writers in 2008 and many other awards, even Juan Marinello Award Order of Distinction from Cuban uh, Culture Ministry. So I think I'll straight go and give the floor to Alex Pausides, who is going to speak on poetry as bridge and pathway. Muchas gracias. Agradezco estar en la India, este país fabuloso. Agradezco al centro y a mi embajada en Delhi las gestiones para que yo pudiera estar aquí. Puentes sobre el océano. Toda palabra humana es un rayo de luz que anula el silencio y las sombras. Un poema es un pequeño estallido de palabras que echa luz sobre la vida y sobre la muerte. La imaginación es hija misteriosa de la luz. El espíritu humano debe, bebe de la luz como de la leche primordial que alimenta el cuerpo y sustenta el alma. La magia nos abre una ventana a la luz. El conocimiento nos abre una puerta a la luz. 
con la magia y el saber atesorado a lo largo de la historia, puede el ser humano echarse al camino en la búsqueda de incesante de la luz, convertirse el mismo al final del túnel de la ignorancia en una espiga. La luz de un hombre solo es una brisna de hierba. La luz de muchos hombres es poderosa como un árbol, pero la luz de toda la humanidad es como un bosque. Los hombres vivimos en comunidad. La soledad del hombre será confinado a los espaciosos palacios y museos del pasado, desde donde nos convoca a unir las soledades en la comunión de muchos para construir con madera perdurable la casa iluminada del espíritu humano. El hombre no puede vivir sin saber que el otro existe. La luz de un hombre enciende la luz en otro hombre. Juntos levanta la hoguera inmortal de la vida en el universo. En el río de la luz vivamos. En el río de la luz braceamos el oleaje de la muerte. Que la luz sea el campo primaveral donde convivan los diferentes. Que la luz sea la patria única de los seres humanos. Los poetas portan un precioso combustible para hacer derna la necesidad de cambiar la vida y hacer nacer un mundo vivible y hermoso. Los poetas tienen la palabra. Pueden quitarnos todo, pero no pueden matar nuestras palabras. La palabra es el oro. La palabra es más que el oro. La palabra es el arma milagrosa para el triunfo. Seamos luz entonces. Alimentemos la luz con nuestros sueños, alcemos la luz en nuestros brazos, no se apague la luz en nuestros ojos. En el hombre vive la cultura, la pasión y la magia, la avidez de conocimiento, el amor por los otros. El hombre primitivo vive en nosotros, los pobres y los ricos, los iguales y los diferentes viven en nosotros. Seamos luz para entregar la luz. Darse la palabra mágica, hacemos todos juntos una luz inmarcesible a la memoria de los hombres. Suficiente valor absoluto tiene el hombre y la mujer como para que demos la vida por ellos. La vida humana es toda luz, devolvamos pues toda la luz a quienes la han alimentado y protegido desde las cosas de Altamira y su lumbre nos dejaron los bisontes galopando altivos hacia la mañana radiante del espíritu humano. La poesía es el puente y el camino. El mundo contemporáneo asiste al milagro de la revolución tecnológica que une en un instante a los antípodas. Un acontecimiento que tardaba, que tardaba meses y años en dar la vuelta al mundo, cifrando los pies de los viajeros o en camellos o en veloces o lentos corceles de los correos y las diligencias, o en las barcas por los ríos, o en los precarios veleros, llega ahora al instante y se instala en la sala de la casa como un insecto maligno o una mariposa. Así de sencillo, así de rápido, a esa velocidad rumba nuestra existencia en el cosmos. El descubrimiento del nuevo mundo, tras la mar o se ha tardado en años llegar a oídos de Europa, como un relámpago que quebra la noche y trae el día, así se propagan las buenas nuevas, tanto como las noticias saciagas nublan el día y lo hacen noche en un instante, o ambas al mismo tiempo. Así, las migraciones sucesivas fueron poblando el planeta. Asimismo, el afán civilizatorio del conocimiento llega a todos los rincones. La poesía cruzó los mares y los saberes, y en los cantos de los esclavos y los braceros que se estableció como memoria, como conocimiento para la vida cotidiana. De esa manera, las vías de comunicación pueden ser, y lo son, el soporte ideal para transmitir la poesía, el conocimiento y la cultura. Los libros, la música, las artes, los bailes, los audiovisuales que transitan por los medios, por la Internet, son las antiguas diligencias y las barcas, y los incansables viajeros que llevaban en sus arcas como tesoros, las especias de Oriente perfumando las noticias de un mundo fabuloso y desconocido. La cultura viaja en los barcos y en los aviones y en los satélites. Quitemos la cabeza nuclear de los misiles y pongamos en su lugar 
la maravillosa simiente de la vida y la floración primaveral de la esperanza y la belleza. Hasta el más humilde de los seres humanos ha sido visitado, al menos ha sido testigo alguna vez de la belleza. De niño tuve una experiencia fabulosa que quiero contarles. El gran poeta cubano José Martí, el más universal, el más ecuménico de los nacidos en la isla, decía que los niños son la esperanza del mundo, que los niños son los que saben querer. Y en verdad, en ellos vive la posibilidad de la belleza y la tierra prometida de la esperanza y el esplendoroso futuro del alma humana. Y recuerdo que cuando era un niño, en las faldas orientales de mi tierra natal, entre el mar y las montañas barbudas, recorría los caminos polvorientos algunas veces, en tiempos de sequía, o anegados en los noviembre de lluvias torrenciales, o en el abril de las flores que lo invadían todo, saltando los charcos donde podía mirar las nubes sin alzar la cabeza al cielo, o dándole calor con mis manos o en mi pecho algún pajarillo caído de su nido por la fuerza de la lluvia y el viento. Recorría, digo, los trillos, aquellos caminos humildes bordeados de hierba y de flores, inventando novelas en mi mente, mente infantil muy fértil entonces, y tal vez influido por las novelas que mi madre escuchaba en la radio y que yo a veces escuchaba también, y eran novelas románticas con amores imposibles y finales felices, y con héroes que luchaban contra los monstruos, los villanos y siempre contra el mal. En una de esas mañanas que no se olvidan, mi madre puso en mis manos un delgado cuadernillo de color azul gris con una silueta dibujada a plumilla en la tapa y una palabra nueva para mí, Tagore, un librito publicado en La Habana con no recuerdo cuántas miles de copias. En aquellos primeros años 60, no era extraño que un libro tuviera una tía de un millón de ejemplares, como fue el caso de la novela El ingenioso Hidalgo, Don Quijote de la Mancha. Pues bien, así entró en mis ojos y en mis oídos aquella mañana el misterioso nombre del poeta y con él el nombre maravilloso de India. Antes que mi tío pronunciara la palabra Krishnamurti, en medio de un café negro tomado en compañía de mi padrino Enrique, al que apodaba el filósofo y que hablaba en voz baja de sus lecturas secretas de teosofía, un tema que yo no comprendí hasta muchos años después. Pero el niño que devoró con pasión las 24 novelas ilustradas de la colección Biblioteca Infantil que su maestro le trajo de la capital, encontró en aquel fino cuadernillo con la figura de Dibueta Gore todo un tesoro de sensaciones, ideas y sentimientos que venían de una gran civilización desconocida. Tagore se convirtió entonces en mi lectura preferida y en la de mis hermanos, como también pasaron de mano en mano de la gente más humilde sus relatos, sus máximas, como después lo sería su ofrenda lírica, un compendio de belleza virginalmente expresada que junto a los fabulosos cuentos del Pancha Tantra que un rey sabio de España había publicado hace muchos siglos y los cantos del Ramayana vendrían a completar y abonar la imaginación que ya el escritor italiano Emilio Salgari había fertilizado previamente a través de las obras que adaptaban dos grandes poetas de Cuba para el pueblo que disfrutaba de las novelas radiofónicas, José Ángel Buesa y Félix Pita Rodríguez, neoromántico el uno, surrealista el segundo, y que ahora convertían el imaginario de un niño campesino en un fabuloso mundo misterioso, habitado de dioses y diosas y selvas y ríos y animales míticos y sagrados y esplendentes singulares seres humanos. Paradigmas de bondad o audacia y un inmenso respeto por sus mayores, por las culturas diversas, por las criaturas que habitaban la tierra virgen, por la madre naturaleza. De ahí que aquellos relatos y la vida de aquel hombre con su figura y su estampa de profeta transmitía a millones de niños de mi tierra el credo, la pasión por la búsqueda incesante de la belleza. El hombre elemental tiene similares intereses y anhelos y visiones en todas las geografías, en todos los tiempos. Y tal vez por esa misma razón, mis proyectos de novelas infantiles 
pudieran ubicarse lo mismo en Bengala que algún paraje cercano a Delhi o en las florestas y bosquecillos de mi pueblo. Tal la imaginación de un niño que hace un árbol como un bosque o cualquier lago como la mar oceana o una flor como todo el jardín y un ideal como todos los ideales. La espiritualidad, el culto al bien, a la verdad y a la belleza frente a la vida cotidiana, frente al pragmatismo y el materialismo, donde el ruido y las luminarias ahogan toda tentativa de apreciar el mundo y las gentes y las cosas en su respiración natural. Pero la realidad es maravillosa, mucho más tal vez que la imaginación, y pletórica de riqueza nos sorprende cada nuevo día que se establece el dominio de ese azar concurrente tan caro al gran poeta cubano José Lezama Lima, quien en su devoción por su padre y padre tutelar José Martí lo bautizara como ese misterio que nos acompaña. Y es cierto, el misterio nos acompaña. Hace unas cuantas semanas estuve en la Biblioteca Nacional de Cuba en un homenaje a un poeta amigo. Y cuán grande fue mi sorpresa cuando en una de las paredes de la biblioteca vi una muestra pictórica singular que me conmovió hasta los cimientos de mi memoria y desbordó secretamente mi alegría. Azar concurrente que se despliega y se hace omnipresente. Estoy en la Biblioteca Nacional José Martí. Me dicen que aquellos trazos y colores cariñosos y mágicos son la expresión feliz de la interpretación y el acercamiento de 13, de 13 seres de niños y adolescentes de la gran y múltiple nación que es India, a la vida, las visiones del mundo, a la poesía y a los dolores y los sufrimientos y los sueños del gran poeta cubano, aquel poeta que creía que los niños son la esperanza depositario del amor. Más de medio millar de niños y adolescentes de India se acercaban al poeta José Martí, una pequeña representación de sus visiones martianas comaba el espacio de la biblioteca. Y recordé la devoción de los niños de mi generación por Rabindranath Tagore. Ahora, más de medio siglo después, un numeroso grupo de niños adolescentes de India me devolvían el regalo, que es como devolver la certidumbre de la esperanza y la, y la validez universal del culto a la belleza. Los niños son la magia y la verdad y la belleza en esos niños y adolescentes que interpretaron al poeta cubano como en aquellos que en los años de nuestra infancia abrieron los ojos a una nueva espiritualidad con la palabra Tagore, con la palabra India, está la semilla inmortal de nuestra perennidad y la saeta de la posibilidad que trazan el amor y el conocimiento. La barca del amor y del conocimiento serán con toda seguridad el horizonte y el camino. Nuestra América es un cosmos, la India es un cosmos, una civilización, un planeta y un mañana que florece en el imaginario del hombre contemporáneo. Una certeza anima y da combustible al ser de un mundo más hermoso para el crecimiento del espíritu y la plena consagración de la condición humana. Y vine del otro lado del mundo a ofrecer mi testimonio humilde de ese credo. La comunicación entre los seres de toda la tierra es una página que debe tener una floración formidable en el tiempo por venir. Póngase nuestra palabra en nuestra vida en ese fuego, bajo ese árbol grandioso donde encuentre amparo y sentido último y esencial el alma humana. ¡Viva la India! Muchas gracias. Un poeta en espíritu y en palabra, sí. <ríe> eh, y estoy leyendo aquí, eh, Culture travels on ships and on planes and on satellites. Let us remove the nuclear warheads from the missile and put, it, put in their place the wondrous seeds of life and the sp spring bloom of hope and beauty. So this is what um, Mr. Pausi has just now said in his entire uh, this, and he actually showed how. And I, I also saw this uh, do documentary, which was shown here only, 
when so many Indian kids, you know, uh, interpreted the Jose Marti and it was it was presented here. So it's really your experience with Tagore and your experience, your, your bringing it together with Marti and our children uh, looking at them, it's really wonderful. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Now I'll go on to my friend, virtual friend who I'm meeting today. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's very nice to have you here, Wendy. Wendy uh, Phillips Rodriguez. She is the Sanskrit scholar. She teaches she teaches uh, uh, our literature. She is actually uh, a Sanskrit scholar, but she teaches our ancient literature to her uh, to her students in Mexico. So uh, and then she has done her uh, studies in. Uh, Edinburgh and then in uh, Cambridge, her PhD in Cambridge uh, in, in, in this field. And uh, I'll not, uh, she's a scholar, she's an upcoming scholar, you can see. So I'll go straight and uh, I'll ask, request her to present her paper. Do you want to present it from here or there? Namaskar. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for being here. Uh, thank you so much to the IIC and the ICCR and everyone who has put effort into bringing us all together in this wonderful meeting. Once again, Indian hospitality has uh, been beyond uh, standards as usual. Thank you so much for that. So there are many well-researched cases one could talk about when enumerating cultural bridges between India and Mexico. I'm fine. Thank you. Just to, uh, this time, however, I would like to dwell in a less evident proximity between both cultures. One that does not arise from the direct meeting of them, but from something we may call a parallelism. Certain ideas that arose in both places around the same time to tackle similar problems that came from what seemed different origins. In other words, I would like to place side by side the proposal of two thinkers, one Mexican and one Indian, to shed light on the way they negotiated fears and worries about the future of their respective nations at the threshold of modernity. The li literary work of the Mexican writer Juan Rulfo is characterized by its local color, by telling the story of lives which have been marked by events that are inextricable from Mexican history. For this reason, to suggest a connection between two figures as geographically distant as Juan Rulfo and Mahatma Gandhi may seem, at first, a trifle arbitrary. Nevertheless, the facet of the Mexican writer that this work addresses is that of him as a social thinker. In such regard, the comparison may reward us with some fruitful revelations. Mahatma Gandhi began to be a public figure in 1917, the year in which Juan Rulfo was born, and he continued to be one until his death in 1948. At that time, Rulfo was 31 years old. One could therefore say that Rulfo's formative years were also the years of Gandhi's contestation. The Indian panorama at the time was quite different from the Mexican one, at least nominally. While Mexico was an independent country vying for agrarian reform, India was in mid-struggle for her independence. For a long time, Gandhi had observed the dynamics fostered by the British Raj and realized that India was a colony, not only on, like, on account of the British, but also because it could not produce many things it needed to subsist. All this led him to conclude that a general autonomy as a country would be impossible if individual autonomy was not achieved beforehand. This is how the concept of Swaraj became the nucleus of his <coughs> ideology. As Gandhi explains in a letter to Leon Tolstoy, quote, independence begins at the bottom. 
A society must be built in which every village has to be self-sustained and capable of managing its own affairs. This does not exclude dependence and willing help from neighbors or from the world. It will be a free and voluntary play of mutual forces. In this structure, composed of innumerable villages, there will be ever-widening, never-ascending circles." Unquote. For years, Gandhi devoted himself to traveling throughout India from village to village, trying to instill the idea of Swaraj, of autonomy, individual autonomy in the population. This implied convincing people of an in-depth change of life. One of the first measures he proposed was to stop buying from the British what the Indian themselves could produce. That was the principal aim of the Salt March in 1930, which was a non-violent manifestation of civil disobedience in which tens of thousands of people went along with Gandhi to perform the symbolic act of taking salt from the sea. Thus, breaking the British monopoly, which had been established for its production and distribution. The episodes of the burning of English clothes also had the same purpose, to withhold payment for what hard work and the land itself could produce. The British East India Company had succeeded in so weakening the textile, textile industry of India that Western clothes manufactured in England but made with Indian textiles but at low prices were sold to Indians for exorbitant amounts. Gandhi then proposed a return to traditional clothes that could even be woven at home. That was the start of the Khadi movement, a very pragmatic idea but laden with deep significance. This was how the spinning wheel, charka, became a symbol of autonomy and spinning a metaphor of national duty. Once the ordinary people assimilated these ideas, the independence of India, as we all know too well, was underway and became an unstoppable movement. From then on, the history of India as a modern nation ran its course. Right at the other side of the world, Juan Rulfo was born the very year the Mexican Revolution came to an end, 1917, as we mentioned. Therefore, his life witnessed everything the post-revolution was about. The history of Gandhi's people and the stories of Rulfo's characters may be different in many regards. Nevertheless, the land they inhabited was very similar. Dry earth that does not produce, that devours human effort and gives nothing in exchange. To Gandhi, that was what the British were doing figuratively, drying the earth of India, turning, turning it into, quote from Rulfo, so much land and such a land for nothing, unquote. As the characters in Rulfo's story, nos han dado la tierra, they have given us the land, would say. Just as Gandhi, Rulfo fed on individual, marginal stories to forge a social ideology on a large scale. He observed how the ideals of the Mexican Revolution did not come to fruition for many people. The land reform promised by the govern government often allocated wasteland to the poorest, who found themselves in an even more demoralizing position than before the armed conflict. The moor, the plain, are eroded landscapes where life is not possible. The desperation of Rulfo's characters exposes their dispossession and the futility of their efforts. Since they have no access to fertile land, therefore they cannot rely on their work to make a living. If they cannot earn a living for themselves, the final consequence is that they do not own their own lives. That is how Juvencio, one of the characters, sets it for in the short story, Diles que no me maten, when he despondently lets his wife abandon him. Quote, he let her go like all the rest had gone, without putting a hand in. The only thing left now to care for was life, and he would hold fast to it no matter what. Unquote. Nevertheless, even Juvencio's own life dangled on the decisions of others, 
and soon he ends up with a face full of bullet holes as he cries the words that give title to the story, tell them not to kill me. Rulfo presents in a literary framework the social web of his characters, their borderline situation, their destiny with no way out. He deals with the constant wearing down of identity, of liberty, of the failed efforts to hold on to a certain individual autonomy. One only needs to remember the sad death of the cow belonging to a girl called Tacha in the tale, Es que somos muy pobres, because we are very poor. The cow, which was swept away by the river, represented the girl's only hold on a decent life. Quote, with the cow, it was different, for there would always be someone who would bring himself to marry her, only to also take away such a nice cow. Unquote. Rulfo's fiction does not seek to be incendiary, but nevertheless, it burns, because it openly exposes the sore of what a world without individual autonomy would be like, at the mercy of the river, of the drought, of the government, of remorse, and of the mistakes of the past. Such risks were precisely those Gandhi feared for his people, the uncontrollable growth of a blind system which would absorb the work of the individual, giving him nothing in return, the dismantling of the delicate social structures on a small scale, the village, the town, the community and the individual's inability to take control of his own existence. Even if Rulfo often uses harsh social realism to depict the demoralizing life of rural Mexicans in the wake of the Mexican Revolution, in the words of Helen, Helen Brown, sometimes the techniques of magical realism are also at work in his fiction. As in the ghost town of Comala, one of the fictitious places crafted by his imagination. People in Comala are dead. It is inhabited only by dead people. And they are dead because they have no agency. They are doomed to endlessly repeat their own history again and again. By means of this literary device, which lends a sharper edge to reality, Rulfo strives bear the issue that somebody with no individual autonomy, with no suaraj, is someone who is not truly alive. In that regard, the characters of Rulfo give textures to the gift, to the fears that Mahatma Gandhi had regarding his own people. In other words, without a system built around the idea of individual autonomy of suaraj, human beings are doomed to share the same dystopian universe as Rulfo's characters. To me, it seems that this comparison with Gandhi's ideology is useful to gain perspective and understand Rulfo, not only in the context of Mexican literature, but also at the level of universal thought, as a profound thinker on the human condition and its relationship with the social structure, making it evident that, if indeed, there is nothing as human as living in a social context. A corrupt system can make life an incomprehensible and dehumanizing experience anywhere in the world. As it is vo voiced by the rural teacher in the story called Luvina, who asks his wife when they reach the desolate town he has been appointed to, what country are we in, Agrippina? For he manages to understand that their condition has even divested them of a definite national identity and has placed them in a limbo destined for those who have nothing. Evidently, this social awareness fermented in Gandhi and Rulfo in very different ways. In Gandhi, it became political activism and in Rulfo, in an aesthetic proposal. Nevertheless, each of them, with their distinctive talents, pointed out at the risks of rushing towards a yet very incomplete modernity, in the words of Alberto Vital. Their latitudes, as we can see, are different, but their thinking, at least regarding the importance of individual autonomy, 
was parallel. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, in the beginning, let me tell you very frankly, I was a bit surprised that how are you going to compare Gandhi with Rulfo, but you have very convincingly uh, argued in your paper about what uh, uh, the freedom, the liberation, the freedom is so important for the individual, and individual autonomy is so important that politics and aesthetics both are uh, striving to achieve that, and it's very good. Thank you for this paper. So now I go on to Professor uh, Minisani, my colleague and uh, good friend. She she is now heading the department where I worked for so many years. Uh, Mini is a ardent, arduous uh, reader, researcher. And she has a lot of work on Mexico and especially uh, on Octavio Pass. And um, she has been lately working on narco, narco literature. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the canvas on which uh, she has uh, so many projects is quite vast. So I'm not going to narrate that. I'll go straight to Mini and I request her to uh, give us uh, her view on um, Octavio Pass. Uh, pa passes Indian poems. Yeah. Thank you, Vibha. And uh, I, I would like to also thank Indian International Center, uh, Dr. Srivastav, and also uh, Professor Sub uh, Sudha Gobalakrishnan, uh, Sonia Gupta, Professor Sonia Gupta, and Niharika for inviting me here and for giving us a chance also to meet in person lots of Latin American intellectuals, the people whom we've been reading all these years. Thank you very much. So I'll, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, go to my paper. My paper is uh, is a is is a work which I've been uh, doing for several years, and I've been adding new accretions to this work from the uh, writings also of critics who have been filling in the various gaps that exist where the uh, 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 Indian output of Octavio Pass is concerned. So. Uh, poetry has been the genre unfailingly invoked by Octavio Paz, whether he wrote about his own life, contemporary history, or Mexico and India, the two countries that fascinated him. In El Arco y la Lira, Octavio Paz had explained the methodology he used to conjoin history and poetry, and how the latter transcended history and politics by connecting with a mythic time. By discovering the roots of language, the poet, according to Pass, looked for archetypes buried deep in the collective consciousness, and with his intuitive knowledge, he perceived the correspondences and the irregular time of history. This perspective earned him not just the ire of intellectuals like Carlos Monsivais, who accused him of mystifying the students' massacre of 1968, but also the incomprehension of readers who were estranged from the context of his poems. To counteract this, in The Bow and the Liar, El Arco y la Lira, Octavio Paz lays down his ideas about how poets transcend history or politics by using cyclical time and myths. Though written in historical time, poetry transcends history because it connects with a mythic time from which dates are absent, but which produces history over and over. His poems are interspersed with numerous texts of anthropology, philosophy, and through these forays, he encountered different consciousness. This was a way of connecting with other times and circumstances and of enhancing perceptions of otherness. In this paper, I revisit Octavio Paz's India oeuvre and draw connections with his studies on Claude Levi-Strauss and Nagarjuna's Madhimic philosophy, which he used for making analogies between one culture and another through which a universal structure became recognizable. His book of poems, East Slope, written during his stay in India, is full of the sights and sounds that the Indian capital is famous for. Indeed, in the Lodi Gardens, the mausoleum of Humayun, these poems seem as contemporary today as when he wrote in the late 50s and 60s of the 20th century. 
As autofictions, they incorporate the eye of the poet with the parodic voices of an India in the first bloom of its post-coloniality. Lines frozen in time, like those of a businessman making a fast buck in Madurai, and the Anglo-Indian Miss Penelope, a relic of British colonialism whose speech past makes his own, throw light on an India in an earlier avatar of its modernity. Despite allegations of elitism, Pass's quirky observations reveal an unerring grasp of the tumult of everyday life from the far from the gentrification of Indian reality often attributed to him. His ownership over his definition of India is evident in poems such as Cochin, Utakamund, Madurai, or in erotic ones like Blanco. The dichotomy, fiction and non-fiction, withers away, although it will still be perennial for a reader, unaware of the quotidian details and past his own studies of Hinduism and Buddhism. Autobiography has always been baked into past's value as a poet. His gaze was that, was that of a Mexican educated in the Western cultural tradition, but he was also aware of the others around him, whose ideas he imbibed. He called this the other voice. He believed the merging of voices, the act of poeticizing, was a way of breaking temporal succession, a means of access to pure time, an immersion in the original waters of existence. In the essay, Signos de Rotacion, he writes the oft-quoted line, Yo no soy tú, y el tú eres mi yo. My endeavor in this paper is to revisit this Indian output through the lens of autofiction and align it with some of his essays in order to find the synchronicities and dissonances between Mexico and India that he discovered. His conjectures were deeply personal and subjective, and yet a readerly learned response to a new intellectual tradition. This, this blend makes his writing difficult to source with exactitude as regards his, this work. However, I've examined his India production on his terms, placing his earliest texts alongside the later ones to tease out a coherence, as the direction of his first works could not have been evident from the start. Pass has often been portrayed as an interloper in Indian reality and has divided readership amongst those who see him as part of a cozy cosmopolitan elite and distance from the real multitudinous India or as one more Westerner interested in ancient Indian religions. By conjecturing on larger bodies of evidence in Pass's over, I will try to show that his gaze, though influenced by surrealism, was not Eurocentric nor even eccentric, but prescient, as it tried to philosophize on the condition of universal humanity through his India connection. From his first conference in 1975 at the Colegio Nacional, Pass made clear that poetry was not something abstract, but born in specific social and personal circumstances. It was in fact the poet who named, called out without explicitly doing so, suggested and evoked and insinuated things. The sociologist and anthropologist were not at odds with the poet inside him, and Pass used the tools of his time to prove that there was no contradiction for him between his political beliefs and poetry. He also mixed Buddhism with his own ideas. In alternating current, he incorporated the ideas of Nagarjuna, the Madhyamic Buddhism philosopher, who uh, and he concluded that the I did not exist because it did not give rise to meaning. It only had meaning relationally, and this relation was founded on an impermanence or shunyata. Being and non-being were also identical and continuous negations, or the paradoxes famous, uh, uh, Pass was famous for, and these gave rise to the being, which was arrived at through a series of absolute negations. In fact, there was no real difference between being and non-being, which was finally identical to nothingness. La negación del mundo implica una vuelta al mundo. Since nothing had any substantial basis and everything was an illusion or dream, concepts like cause and reason were also untenable. Nothing had an independent existence or being and everything dissolved into the universal being. As he wrote in Alternating Current, it would be a mistake to believe that we are looking to Buddhism for a truth that is foreign to our tradition. What we are seeking is a confirmation of a truth we already know. Buddhist ideas on negations and indetermination in the language of surrealism are the mainstay of a poem like Blanco. Correspondences and analogies between India and Mexico and or East and West abound. Pass had earlier laid out his idea of poetry as a collective exercise which he exemplified in the writing of Blanco. 
the poem Blanco has three columns, and the one on the right continuously negates the left with the blank spaces, saying something that words cannot. The negation creates a third text and be, can be considered an example of simultaneism, ripe for different interpretation. The open text was like a certain kind of Buddhism, all-inclusive, but also hearkened to structuralism in which each element only had value in relation to the other. The goal was never to resolve contradictions, but to nurture alterities. No absolute meaning could be possible, and paradox did not triumph over logic. Everything dissolved in the universal being. Pass borrowed the eroticism of Tantric Buddhism, citing from the Havajra Tantra at the beginning. And I quote, the world is enslaved by passion and also liberated by it. Tantric Buddhism, a mixture of spirituality and eroticism, entailed a focus on rites and rituals which made men abjure morality and the world and give oneself up to sensuality. This sensuality finally also led to nothingness or infinity, which were the same thing. The tantric ritual did not result in the satisfaction of the ego, but the dissolution of the latter in the emptiness and nothingness. Flashes of meaning and intuitions guide us to understand what Pass had tried to do in this poem. The detritus of particularities, specific places, dissolves. Bodies are severed from souls, but what endures are universal feelings and sensations, the stories we make of them, the universal sensibility or being. In the poem, A Tale of Two Gardens, Pass refers to the garden of his youth in Mixcoac and the one on Prithviraj Road in New Delhi. We envision tableaus of the two gardens as a narrative drifts from the neem tree in the Delhi garden and to Mexico DF the, on the volcano bed of Akhusco. In another poem, like Himachal Pradesh, various, called Himachal Pradesh, various historical periods, places, and situations coexist. The tone is mildly critical of the world order, but never sententious. A Dalit washes the floor of a tourist dark bungalow or club, while local Englishmen, colonial survivors, placidly talk about crickets and dowagers play bridge. A local lawyer, much to the chagrin of his wife, tries to seduce a foreigner and make a bit of money. These are typical scenes from an era prior to economic liberalization, when patrician values get mixed with modern venalities, all on the bedrock of a caste system. Within Pass brings in winkingly suggestive scenes of vultures that feed on carrion and get so fat that they can't fly. Even a crippled eagle only has to wait for the remains of carrion. In another part of the world, the 1968 Students' Revolt is taking place, but in India, it seemed, the poem seems to say, stubborn inequality persists without demur. Allegations of Western superiority do not fit tidily on his poems, as his incongruities show us how indigenous tradition is not to be denigrated or considered backward. In fact, Pass is decidedly decolonial here, as in successive verses, both in Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, he sets out parallel histories. In the latter poem, he intersperses an account of the Toda tribe of the Nilgiri Hills, whose habits, redolent of tradition, I quote, guard a secret from Sumeria, not knowing that they guard it, end of quote, with the image of a cantankerous Anglo-Indian lady, a relic of British colonialism who derides India, and I quote, on the veranda of the Cecil Hotel, Miss Penelope, canary-colored hair, woolen stockings, and walking stick, has been saying for 30 years, O oh, India, country of missed opportunities, end of quote. Miss Penelope has been given a voice by Pass, a reminder of the autofiction <laughs> earlier alluded to. Pass weaponizes frivolity in the poem The Effects of Baptism, but we are made aware of the experiential limitations of privilege. Hassan, a Muslim, gets baptized when he marries a Christian and is named Eric by the priest. And I quote, as though he were a Viking. Now he has two names but only one wife. End of quote. Conversion to another religion, Pass seems to say, will not shield prejudice. In Cochin, he d takes a dig at organized religion. The city is dotted with white Portuguese churches and women go to church with, I quote, jasmine in their hair and earrings of gold. They go off to six o'clock mass, not in Mexico City or Cadiz, but in Travancore, uh, end of quote. Even the bovines are religious, though humans might be heretical. And I quote, beating more furiously before the Nestorian patriarch, my heretical heart. 
in the Christian cemetery graze dogmatic, probably Shaivite cows, end of quote. Pass's anecdotes take on a life of their own and he manages to tear down blinders and boundaries through curious and incongruous juxtapositions. He pivots knowingly from the sacred to the profane with eddies of humour. Prosaic occasions get extraordinary angles. In the poem titled Madurai, Pass highlights hypocrisy and corruption. And I quote the poem, In the bar at the British club, soft drinks, no Englishman. Our city is holy and rates high. We hear the voice of Mr. K.J. Chidambaram, who owns a tourist bus company and is the owner of the Great Lingam. He enlightens the readership about the fish eye goddess Minakshi Temple while sipping juice in a bar at the British club where no alcohol is served. Through Pass's eyes, we see many of India's ubiquitous locales, Mysore, Udaipur, Vrindavan, Elephanta. In the tomb of Amir Khusro, he describes with veracity the Basti or Barrio of Nizamuddin East in New Delhi, where I quote, trees heavy with birds hold the afternoon up with their hands, end of quote, where beggars jostle curious tourists amongst the marble tombs of the poet Amir Khusro and the Saint Nizamuddin Olya. The syllables of the poet still linger amongst, I quote, the vagabond architectures, as Pass writes allegorically. Every poem is time and burns. In the poem, the universality of the bonding or competition between the poet and the theologian is alluded to. Amir Khusro is, I quote, the parrot or mockingbird who either speaks truth to power or is beholden to it. In Figures and Figurations, in, written in 1999, which is a compilation of poems, sketches, and photographs by Pass and his wife, Marie Cosse, we come across the poem, India. These, and I quote from the poem, these letters and sinuous lines that entwine and separate on the paper are like the palm of a hand, are they India? And the paw of tawny metal forged by the sun, chilled by the moon, its claws squeezing a hard glass ball. And then there's a parenthesis. The thousands of candles burning and shining that the faithful launch each night. Are they a prophecy, a riddle, the memory of an encounter, the scattered signs of fortune? End of quote. To those familiar with the imagery of India, the candles on the river hearken to the holy city of Varanasi or even Haridwar, and the paw of tawny metal belongs to a lion on the Ashoka pillar, perhaps from the city of Bangalore. The expanding context of the poem makes us accept the digressions within digressions. His teeming mind picked up multifarious examples, and his paradigms can never be considered a distillate of Eurocentric thought, as his first-hand experience made him aware that broad-brush generalizations were riven with exclusions. Unlike the Indologists, he did not study only ancient India, and when he did, there was no rushed idealization, nor did he concentrate only on Hinduism, but also on Buddhism. And when he contemplated modern India, the outward sheen of cosmopolitanism did not distract him. He never positioned the East as directly opposed to the West, and neither did he view the Orient as a homogeneous mass. He made distinctions between Hindu temples, Mughal edifices and Buddhist sanctuaries. His constant evocations of the past in his Indian poems was a reminder of the commingling of various epochs in the present. The communal intimacy that he earnestly prescribed for the reading of a poem like Blanco, the lengthy correspondence in which he cajoled publishers to do his bidding, as Enrico Mario Santi has compiled in Archivo Blanco, is testimony to his mantra of inclusiveness. Eerily, there is an ageless current in Pass's India poems. The irrelevancy of human beings within the greater universe is part of the theory of negation and shunyata and is supposed to point to a final liberation, a fascinating perspective for one nurtured in the tradition of liberators and the liberated. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mini. Uh, Interesting, no, how observant he was, but uh, I don't know, sometimes even when I read uh, Pass, I feel that he has uh, always a kind of a dichotomy, no, a, a contradiction in his mind as to how to interpret India, you know, and, and the fact that he was more attracted to a Buddhism. I don't know whether I'm right. 
yes, but yes. Buddhism yes. was uh, very uh, central to his India uh, India experience. So yeah, interesting, uh, interesting. It's it 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 uh, it reads like a like a you know mysterious thing also that you want to discover more after all where he wants to take us. Thank you. Vinny. So now we go to our last speaker. We have a diplomat and a poet. So uh, imagine uh, here <laughs> uh, the afternoon with the, uh, the afternoon wind comes and goes between India and Brazil tirelessly. So here it is. Uh, what um, his last posting, I think, was Brazil. Was it last to last? Okay, so. <laughs> Maybe he is going to speak uh, about his uh, experience in Brazil, but especially with the poetess Cecilia Mireles. I'll speak from here because my Brazilian friends but are this I side; they say, can't see. I must see. say that he is a uh, he has he is a prolific uh, writer because he has so many books of poems. Plus, he has been reading poetry even uh, all over the world. He is the Sark Literary Award winner. So here we have. Abhay Kumar, a diplomat and a poet. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Moria, and distinguished guests from India and Latin America. I'm going to share with you uh, an article I had written uh, in memory of Cecilia Merelis, the poet who came to India and fell in love with it. Uh, many of uh, us who study Latin America know about uh, Octavio Paz, know about Pablo Neruda, Gabriela Mistral, uh, and so many others from Latin America. But uh, very few of uh, uh, us know about actually Cecilia Merelis. The afternoon wind comes and goes between India and Brazil tirelessly. Cecilia Merelis, she wrote these lines in a poem titled Mahatma Gandhi. Among the Latin American literary giants who wrote about India, the works of Octavio Paz and Pablo Neruda are well known, but not many are acquainted with Cecilia Merelis. The celebrated Brazilian poet visited India in 1953 and wrote a book-length collection of impre impressionistic poems titled Poemas Escritos na India on places such as Mumbai, Delhi, Patna, Kolkata, Katak, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Puri, Aurangabad, Agra, Jaipur, Chennai, Goa, and personalities such as Mahatma Gandhi, Ravindranath Tagore, Sarojini Naidu, Binova Bhave, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, among others. She also wrote uh, several chronicles related to her trip to India. Just after her arrival in India on January 1st, 1953, she stated, as far as Indian life is concerned, I confess it seems as familiar to me as if I had always lived here. She further added, for many reasons one can come to India. I come for Gandhi. The Mahatma. During her visit, she was awarded an honorary doctorate by the Delhi University, which was handed over to her by India's first president, Rajendra Prasad. She was the first Brazilian writer to spend considerable time traveling across India and produce a body of impressionistic poems about life in India. She considered India as her spiritual motherland. The Brazilian embassy in New Delhi published a bilingual edition of her 71 poems translated from Portuguese into English by Professor Dilip Londo and Rita Sanyal <coughs> in 2003 to mark the 50th anniversary of Cecilia Merelis' historic trip to India. Londo was very kind to send me a copy of this book with a personal note and that book became the main source of my discovery to Cecilia Mireles. And I have used many of the quotes from that book in this paper. 
one of the finest voices of Cecilia Mer of Brazilian poetry and Portuguese language, Merelis set out to India on a spiritual inquiry, quest for self-realization, poetic meditation, and searching for the wisdom of life. In her song for peaceful India, she writes, those who know you are touched forever in their hearts. O oh, patient India. She had a long poetic partnership with India. The second poem of her first collection of poem, Spectros, is titled Brahmin. With a beard spilling over his chest in the silent forest, the Brahmin dreams in summer. The brief elegy for Pandit Nehru is one of her last poems she wrote before dying in 1964. Much before traveling to India in 1953, she had imbibed Vedas, Upanishads, Puranas, Ramayana, and Mahabharat, Panchtantra, works of Kalidas, Kabir, Mirabai, and Tulsidas, among others. India and Indian philosophy is present throughout her poetic work. Indian philosophy of non-dualism is evident in, his, in these lines. It's your eternity. It's eternity. It's you. She had a lifelong fascination with the living spiritual tradition of India. And she wrote, poetry in India, poetry is not futile versification. It is an inner illumination, as Alex was talking about light. A sort of holiness and prophetism. The word of the poet is not a personal ability. A dilettante exercise. It's instead an example, a revelation, a teaching through sounds and rhythms. How fortunate am I to be able to breathe in a country where one still thinks in those terms? What a hope in life. What a renewal of faith in humanity. In a letter to a friend in 1938, she wrote, when my love for India reached a peak, strange things happened to me. At night, in the middle of a dream, I seemed to detach myself from the body and move through unique places with colorful atmospheres where certain figures slid through me, light, fire, music, rhythm, it was ecstasy. She candidly acknowledged her personal debt towards India. In an unpublished manuscript titled What We Owe to India, she writes, we Brazilians are privileged inheritors of things from India, which she further elaborated in her speech at a seminar on Gandhi. The Indian vocation of Brazil is a kind of historical fate when one remembers that according to ancient texts, the discovery of Brazil was a mere accident on the route of the navigators bound for India. In her chronicle, Kingdom of Hanuman, she noted, India is a country where wisdom is not only found in the sacred books, but in daily life. At the age of 22, she dedicated a poem to Tagore titled, Most Divine Poet. In your sacred poems, hovering like moons over the world that I have never known, in your songs, if the words are of God or your own, and I believe you are about to appear, my eyes are full of sadness. The times are pitiless, men are pitiless. And all will know you are a living stuff. You are there. You exist. Her educational policies in Brazil borrowed much from the experiments in Shanti Niketan. Her Portuguese translation of Tagore's post office was successfully staged in Rio in 1949. Mahatma Gandhi had a significant influence on her life. She wrote two poems on, the Mahatma, on Mahatma, one following his assassination in 1948, titled Elegy on the Death of Gandhi, 
and another during her visit to India in 1953 when she saw him everywhere in elegy she wrote these memorable lines the afternoon wind comes and goes between India and Brazil tirelessly above all my brothers non violence but they are all carrying their smoking guns in the bottom of their pockets and you were in fact the only one without guns without pockets without lies unarmed up to the veins free from the eve and the next day about jawaharlal nehru she wrote a f- to a friend tomorrow i have a special lunch with nehru he looks very much like me he has many teeth and he is very black like me i believe we will become good friends she is fascinated with the dark complexion which figures in many of her poems including this one buddha jesus muhammad they were all dark people people who lived on faith people who died of sorrow she uses the hindustani word word bhai very skillfully in her poem crowd where are those steps rushing to bhai to meet home at whose call in which place for what reason she also uses bhai in her poems music and colorful drawing as well in colorful drawings she says your eyes were black bhai starless absolute night extreme nocturnal darkness outside this world she is moving and profound while she describes a poor man he was not a sculpture through though equally precise dry shaped in deep folds of dust nobody gave him anything didn't they see him couldn't they they passed by we passed by he was such an ancient man and he seemed immortal so poor that he seemed divine thank you saris mustard peacocks buffaloes elephant birds mango trees sugarcane fields spices pepper gold silk incense dust deserts snake charmers hindu family pepper anise and clove cinnamon saffron sandal and coal figure in her poems she writes about patna a place i come from a place where i spent she spent three a place i spent three years of my life <laughs> everything was humble in patna dry taps sad curtains sleepy rooms but the pea flowers smelt with the violence of a bird that pours out its whole song she is very poignant in describing the wrinkled elephant the wrinkled elephant has only an old yellow rug a torn and poor yellow rug quite different from the magnificent covers the brocades that once covered its forefathers bearers of pa- palkis look at these beautiful words in her blind man of hyderabad the city is like a coin of silver that passes from hand to hand the blind man's hand is the is the boy's hand the blind man's hand is in the boy's hand his beard belongs to the wind his eyes belong to the dream in her poem pomegranates she uses the word mali we shall not let the garden die of thirst mali sprinkles the plants with a little water like whom does he do it like one who prays each pot receives five or six drops of water and also the love of mali a dark and serious love in a white turban she longs to live in hawa mahal in jaipur in her poem title jaipur many goodbyes to hawa mahal wherein i should live there is no record of her visiting kashmir but she wrote a song for the embroiderers of kashmir praising them the gardens of the world are not greater than your embroidery 
In her poem, Women of Puri, she writes, Someone will remember your blue figures among the temples and the sea. Someone will remember your squatting body. Black goddesses of chest naked breasts. In her poem on Taj Mahal, she is mystical. Between death and eternity lies love. That everlasting memory. In Nightfall, she is lyrical. The huts are like ancient people sitting, pondering. A small song sounds at the end of the world. A small moon delineates itself in the sky high above. In her poem, in her poetry collection, poems written in India, titled Beach at the End of the World, she asks, In this place of only sand, no longer land, not yet sea, we could sing, O night, solitude, mist, country of voiceless stars. What shall we sing? And the poem ends on a positive yet poignant note. Friends, let's sing in this impossible place, neither land nor sea. The beach at the end of the world that will not retain our shadows nor our voices. She wrote a number of poems at different stages of her poetic career. And in a poem on Kalidas's Sakuntala, she, write, she wrote, and Sakuntala in silence, tied in her wet locks, white ribbons of jasmine. If Sakuntala was all that, as if she dried her hair in the sun, ephemeral and endless maid, she sums up her spiritual journey to India in her poem, Unfortunately, the photographs are missing. But the photographs are missing, and that moment has vanished behind in the path of time, and those two shadows became more and more distant. Realization that lasts is pictureless. In her poem, Cosmic Dance, she sees Nataraza and India dancing together. Nataraza dances, invisible and visible, and from north to south, India dances along with him. What, what a powerful imagery. She longs to go back to India again in her poem written in 1961, three years before her untimely death. Russ, Russ, it's a trip to India. A legend exists that when she was on deathbed, three Indians were reported to be present there to give her last, uh, her last, the words of ex exhortation before she died. This was uh, my tribute to Cecilia Morales, and uh, I would like to end it with, uh, because the topic is also, you know, <laughs> Cecilia Morales and I, so I just want to walk you through a little bit of, uh, I was uh, uh, posted in Brazil as India's Deputy Chief of Mission from 2016 to 19, and uh, during uh, my three years in Brazil, uh, I was, uh, uh, able to learn Portuguese. Uh, uh, like, I know the difference between tudo bem and tudo bom. <laughs> so, uh, my Brazilian friends are here to listen to me. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, was able to tra not only learn Portuguese, but also because of my deep interest in poetry, able to translate the works of 60 Brazilian poets into English. And this book has been published uh, as New Brazilian Poems a bilingual anthology after Elizabeth Bishop, who had done an anthology of bi Brazilian poetry earlier. And uh, 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 it's the uh, next one. I was also, I had also edited a book called uh, 100 Great Indian Poems, uh, which has been translated into several languages. And uh, 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 it, was, uh, it was during my stay that uh, these poems were translated into Portuguese and published by the University of Sao Paulo. These are known as 100 Grandis Poemas Ta India. And uh, uh, I was also able to write a collection of poems on the capital city of Brazil, Brasilia. And it is titled The Prophecy of Brasilia. These are all like paying it back to Cecilia Morales. That's why I'm mentioning all these. And not only to Cecilia Morales, 
but also I was able to travel the whole Latin America actually during my three years stay in Bra Brazil. And I have put together a collection of poems called the Alphabets of Latin America, which, uh, uh, which has poems on almost every, uh, every uh, country in Latin America, their monuments, personalities, cuisine, etc. And uh, I'll just take you through a video of the alphabets of Latin America just after this one. The, the, these poems, 100 great Indian poems, were also translated into Spanish and published by the University of Nuevo Leon in Monterrey. And, uh, uh, and that's, uh, 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 that makes me uh, to just to say that uh, what a fascinating journey it has been. And I'll leave you with a very short presentation on the alphabets of Latin America. Meanwhile, uh, they fixed the thing. Meanwhile, I'll read a poem about uh, Octavio Paz, uh, uh, who was. <laughs> Octavio Paz, history is one thing, our lives something else. I have survived, and that's enough. Staring at a draft of shadows, I straddle between two pasts. My feet on two boats. I keep afloat composing poems. I'm alone in a library reading forbidden books. I lose. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I lose my faith reading Voltaire. The library crumbles in front of my eyes. I'm happy I have survived. I come across Godemiches in Paris. Don't know what are these. Embarrassed, I ask a surrealist who whispers in my ears. These are objects to overcome profound human loneliness. I think all fighting is absurd, but cannot tell it to anyone. So I go to see Neruda. He calls me a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> then embraces me affectionately, calling me son. Meeting Buddha in India. On the footpath, I ask, what is self? Buddha smiles and turns into a pile of stones. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Then no questions and now. We'll just stick to 30 seconds. I need. You can continue. I need. The organizers will tell me whether we have time for questions or. We can take questions while we try to fix this. So that is okay. So while this thing is getting fixed, people can ask some questions. While the things are getting fixed, could you, if you have any question to any of the speakers here, please go ahead. I am S.S. Bakhdi, Director Institute of UN and UNESCO Studies. So we have heard uh, Madam Sani, her last of um, exegesis on the great uh, Latin American poet. But you know, there are so many ideas, but we would just like to know if you have to sum up the, the central theme of Octavio Paz and his political uh, works, uh, which in Germany called German called Zit Gist. So, how you will define Octavio Paz and his central themes? Uh, whatever he has written in his great works, one poem or 100 poems or 50 poems, does he express some very central idea um, to which he is wedded? Okay, Th thank you for the question. Uh, in one word, I would say paradox. That's the essence of his poems as well. Huh? See, that's why he found such comfort in Buddhism and Shunyata, the negations, that in the impermanence, these these words which I'm throwing out, and I particularly liked his poem also about Octavio Paz, except the last line which I didn't understand about how Buddhism becomes a pile of stones. We, I mean, my, my I <laughs> <laughs> understanding of Buddhism is it's Maya. It's all you know. It's the irrelevancy of human beings in the universe. Hmm? Yeah, that's so, exactly the images. No, he asks Buddha, "What is what is self?" So Buddha smiles and turns into a pile of stones. Mm -hmm. Buddha turns into a pile of stones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, th this is what, you see, that uh, he, uh, we all, lots of us here know his political trajectory. Huh? Now the idea was also that uh, he didn't ever take, he reneged, according to some, he reneged from a particular politics and went elsewhere. But that was also local politics within Mexico. You see, universally, he, uh, he maintained, to some of us who have studied him, he maintained the same positions throughout, right? Within Mexico as well, he gained the ire of many intellectuals. Then within uh, our space as well, the, there were uh, problems with the, uh, the way his poems were received. He was accused very recently also by one of his compatriots of gentrification of Indian reality. Now, uh, uh, curiously, and that's another paradox, a book was brought out last year by Indian intellectuals, Ashok Vajpayee, etc. And they showed uh, very clearly through anecdotal evidence how far past was from being elitist. You see, at that point of time, also in the 1950s, like I mean, it, it, he wasn't part of a cozy intellectual elite. He uh, these uh, he managed to get fellowships for Satish Gujral, etc., to go to Mexico. Now, these were also this was a time after these were uh, refugees after partition who had come to India. So the, this was a circle of intimate friends far from this elitist, gentrified reality which he's supposed to have lived in. So I would say paradox, you know, keeping all this in mind. That's all right. No crosstalk, please. Any other question? If it is, uh, yeah, please. Uh, hola, ¿puedo hacer la pregunta en español? Can I do the question in sí, Spanish? Okay. Bueno, entonces la pregunta es para Wendy. Y es una pregunta, en realidad, eh, puedes responder de muchas formas. ¿no? Eh, esta influencia que se ve, estos paralelos entre las trayectorias de Rulfo, eh, de Gandhi y otros, hoy en día en México tienen eco, esa es mi pregunta en general. O sea, puedes responder como quieras, no te preocupes. O sea, pero en general también puedes hablar de la influencia de la India todavía en México, si existe algo 
del conocimiento de la literatura, si esto se ve en la cultura popular, no sé. Gracias. Gracias por tu pregunta que me hace reflexionar mucho. Eh, como decía, son paralelismos, no, no puedo yo identificar una influencia directa, bueno, el movimiento de Gandhi estaba en, en las noticias, en los medios de comunicación, quizá de esa manera Rulfo, no sé, son cosas que están en el, en el aire. Ahora, ¿cómo vemos nosotros en México a Rulfo? Pues, pues lo vemos como una gran pregunta que no sabemos cómo respondernos, es… Hay, hay ideales que se cumplieron, hay ideales que nunca se cumplieron, todavía nos seguimos preguntando. Gracias. Later, much later. Uh, yeah. He is the only Mexican literary person who got the Nobel Prize, I think. So, any other person who got in this type of field any Nobel Prize? From Mexico? No. Your Mexican no, no. background? Not, uh, not literature. Uh, uh, Garcia Robles. But he was not a literature person. Yeah. Mm, okay. Any other question? Almost getting it. So just <laughs> it's all right. Okay, okay, we'll just <laughs> poetry. Coffee over you, Take out. Okay. Okay, okay, so. I think right. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so, so thanks to, uh, to all the speakers and thanks to the public and in, it was an interesting yeah. session. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Maurya. Yeah. And uh, may I request Dr. Kopalakrishnan to come and honor our speakers. Me gustaría a mí mucho. Me, no, yo no tengo publicaciones. Yo creo que. Okay. 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 For me, oh, yeah. also. Yeah. 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 Sí, ahora es el de